and welcome back to the second session of our three-part webinar series about extreme customer centricity. We're going to break it down. Enough with the fluffy CX stuff, we're going to talk business. Last time we talked about customer uh, service, the customer care center of 2021. Today, we will dive deeper into product innovation, service design. How can we make products and services that are relevant to our customers? For our loyal, loyal viewers, you know that we build the webinar around the questions that you have sent us. So I'm going to fire a lot of questions at Stephen and he is going to answer them. Hey, Stephen, welcome Bless back. Me. Thank you. Good to be back. Still excited? Always. Okay, perfect. So we're going to dive right in. Um, okay. We see and we talk a lot about customer experience and also in the previous webinars, we talk a lot about empathy and people, but we never really go deep and, and dive deep into everything to do with products. Okay. But we know that a lot of companies, they do a lot of innovation, they have service departments, they have product departments, but we also know that even where they have large R&D budgets, it can go wrong. If we think about, and they come from your keynotes, Kodak, uh, Nokia, they are like almost legendary examples of where it can even go wrong, even when there is product innovation. So mm -hmm. the question to you, and it also comes from the audience is, how can you put product innovation at the forefront of the customers and at the forefront of their expectations? Yeah, it's terrible to see how many innovations fail. Yeah, uh, There are more failures than successes with innovation. And one of the big issues is that companies organize their innovation from within. And I think you need to turn that around and figure out a way and organize yourself to be more customer centric in your innovation. And I see three things, three tactics that yep. you can work with. The first one is get a deep understanding of your consumer's expectations, habits, behavior, and expectations. You can use existing data. How are they using existing products? You can use market research. You can use information that is be found on that can be found on social media. And really having an in-depth understanding about how they use your products, and I think you need to observe their behavior, is a first step in that. Okay. Uh, a second one that I see is to include customers in the innovation process. And I'm not talking about the average customer. I'm talking about the expert user. Who are the experts in your domain? Uh, if you're in, in gaming, the people who are gaming yes. every single day. If you're in real estate, people who have maybe a patrimonium of 10 apartments and they're, they're looking for more investments. If you're mm -hmm. in financial services, people who are actively using all the tools. Those kind of people, everyone has expert users. Bring them close to you and involve them in the innovation process. That will help you to get feedback directly from your heavy users. And, and you know, uh, criticism could be that people say, yeah, but we're, we're trying to reach the average customer. We don't want to create something for the expert customer. I think that's a mistake. I think you do need to create stuff that excites the expert user because they're going to be your first clients. They're going to be the ones that start spreading the news. They're going to be the ones that convince the majority and the average customer to follow your lead. So building together with those lead users, those expert users, is a step that will help you to become more customer focused in your innovation. That's number two. And number three is to make sure that you understand that a launch of a product is not the end of a cycle. It's the beginning of a cycle because then you're putting something into the marketplace and people will start using them. People will start experimenting with them. They will give feedback about it, real life feedback. And I think it's important to, to capture that feedback and to see if you made the right choice with that innovation. Did you communicate about the right uh, circumstances that people use them? Are you talking to the right people? Uh, the, and, and go back to the drawing board and be very <coughs> critical after you launch the innovation to see what you need to change rapidly in the first three or four weeks to make the success or to make the launch more successful. Okay, I just want to go back to your, your point where you talk about the heavy users. Um, but if I bring that together with convenience, of course, the heavy users, they will go above and beyond. They use it every day. So it becomes easy just by using it frequently. Then how do you kind of connect that to the average user that doesn't use a product that frequently? How can they then test that convenience, that ease of use? 
How do you see that? Convenience is absolutely necessary. Um, but I do believe that the expert users perfectly know what works well and doesn't work well. They use your platform every single day and they have ideas and thoughts on how to improve it. So the, these guys can be very useful to detect problems, to detect frictions. Um, and if you walk them through your existing platforms and you talk with them about them, they will give you so much learnings that will help you to make it more convenient for the average user. Yeah, okay. So we said we were going to talk about real business today okay. and not just theory. So can you think of some great examples where companies did go above and beyond in creating products that don't just listen to the surface of what customers need, but actually do something that adds value to customers' lives? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite examples. We talked about them last time as well. The uh, insurance company yeah. Central Beheer, my friends from the Netherlands. They, as I told you last time, they want to achieve a net promoter score of plus 50 in everything that they do. And they want to go beyond the traditional approach in insurances. Now, let, let's talk about their product car insurance for a second. Yeah. There's a problem with customers who have a car insurance. And maybe you will recognize this, but I have this every year. Every year, every year with my car, I bump into something. Uh, when I'm trying to park and I'm in a hurry, I hit a pole or I hit a small brick wall that I didn't see. Or even when my sensors are alarming me, I go too fast and bomb, <laughs> I hit it. It happens to me every year. And then I have a scratch or a dent in my car, but usually it's a small dent or a small scratch. And then I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna ask my insurance company for that. To, to fix that. I'm not going to let it fix. It's too expensive. Because it's a lot of hassle. It's a lot of hassle. And after <clears> a few <throat> weeks, you don't see the problem anymore. It's just part of your new car that you have that. And Central Beheer knows this. And because of that, they created this new service for their clients. It's a free service. It's called the Little Dent Days. How awesome. In Dutch, yeah. Kleine Dukjes Dagen. That, that's such a beautiful name. And what they do is multiple times per year, four times per year, in about 30 locations in the Netherlands, they invite their clients who have a car insurance and say, look, if you have a little dent or a small scratch in your car, you can come to that location that day and we're gonna fix that for you completely for free because we love you, dear customer, and we know that you find that important and we know you don't wanna use the insurance, but still, we're gonna help you. And then you go there and it's like, it's, it's like a party, basically, because they have a band who's playing music while you wait. Your, their own employees make cake for the people who come there. So it's like a buffet with cakes and you get out of your car, you have cake served to you by the Central Beheer employees. And in the meantime, they fix your car. It's the Kleine Dukies Festival. It's a festival. Yeah. Yeah, it's a small festival. And again, it has a, a, a diverse effect. Customers think it's the most awesome thing in the world. I mean, an insurance company that reaches out to you for a free service and they take care of everything is unseen. Exactly. So customers really happy. You have a beautiful car again, but the employees, they love it as well. Because they see the excitement. They finally, in an insurance industry, you don't see your clients that often face to face. Yeah. Suddenly they see them, they can give them cake, they have some music. Yeah and they help them out. But also, usually when you talk to your insurance company, something really did go wrong. Yeah, because, And then that interaction is a negative one by default, whereas yeah. now they've created a positive encounter between employees yeah. and customers. That's what they try to do. They try to see how can we create positive encounters. They do the same thing with the insurance for your house to protect it against fire and, and water damage and so on. Like in the Netherlands, the legislation changed for smoke detectors. Yeah. And then you can uh, send a letter, email to your customers and say, dear customer, you need a new smoke detector or you're no longer insured. Kind regards, your insurance company. Yeah, threatening. Or you can do what Central Beheer does. They send a letter and say, hey guys, you know, we have a new legislation, you need new smoke detectors. Y you can change them, of course, but if you want, we can come to your house and do that for you. You just have to pay us for the hardware. We'll do the service for free. And then you're 100% sure that everything is okay. So just let us know and we'll be happy to help you out with that. So they look for those moments. I think it's brilliant to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's great examples. But um, knowing our audience a little bit, I know also the next question that would come <laughs> is, do you also have these kinds of examples in the, in a business to business environment? Because I think it's easy to to kind of find ways to please consumers, but how can you also do the same in B2B? Very good point. Um, and of course, I have a B2B example. I was recently invited by a Belgian B2B company called Wautim, and it's a uh, painting company. So they go to 
companies, they go to large enterprises, they go to retail stores and they paint these buildings, they paint stores, they paint offices, that's what they do. And at a certain moment, they got invited by a client, Center Parks. And they said, if we're going to renovate all the little houses that we rent out to our clients in the, yep, in the big parks, assignment. big yep. assignment, and they, they won that one. And then Center Park said, but actually, if we look about, if we look at the renovation process, it's a real burden for us because yeah. we have someone who does the painting, we have someone for the flooring, we have someone who is taking care of the doors. And we're actually, we would hope that someone would do everything for us. And then this painting company said, well, we're willing to change our company to help you with that. And for that one client, they completely changed their philosophy. Of course, they're still doing the painting, but they're taking care of the floors, they're taking care of the doors, they're taking care of everything except for the bathroom. That's a specialized company, but everything else. They're just going to do. They're just going to do that because they want to remove that burden yeah. from their big client. Yeah. So they've done that for center parks. And now this is part of their business. Now they are a full service partner to fix the interior of B2B projects and their customers love them for it. Yeah. Because finally they have someone in this world of construction works that understands the customer that really listens to the feedback and change their entire organization to help them out and to fulfill that yeah. uh, And to that do dream. everything from A to Z and take away all of the burden. Wow, that is a spectacular it's cool example. example. Yeah, it's yeah. a spectacular yeah. company. Very, very cool what they do. Okay, but what makes these companies so different and what can other companies or product departments learn from them? I have a list that I created for myself to check if a company is really customer centric or not. Okay, now I'm curious. And you could do that at a very high level kind of way. I say, are they measuring customer satisfaction? Is uh, are they talking about the customers? Are customer is customer happiness one of the strategic pillars? I don't look at that because everyone has that. That no doesn't make the reports, difference. You don't read them. No, no. I look for symbols of extreme customer centricity, and I have three of them. First thing that I check is how does a company deal with opposing interests? An opposing interest means that you as a customer have a different interest than me as your client. Imagine a bank. Imagine that I have a bank account. Uh, somewhere, but I don't use that bank account anymore. I've forgotten about it. It's something from my past, yeah. but I still automatically pay that bank a yearly fee. What do you do if you are the management of a bank? Do you call them and say, Stephen, you have this account. You had it for seven years. You're paying us. Th this, is, this is not good. We're going to repay you for those seven years because you didn't use it. Or do you decide to be very silent because it's very easy money? That's an opposing interest. How do you react? Yeah. Airbnb that decided in January 2021, when there were big issues in, in Washington, D.C. and the United States, they decided to check every place that they rented out. And if they thought that they had people that would cause problem in their capital, they canceled that uh, reservation. Wow. Even though they lost money, they didn't want to be responsible for riots and vandalism in the city. It's an opposing interest, but they chose to do the right thing yeah. and lose money because of that. What do you do when there's an opposing interest? That's number one. First thing that I look at is how do you deal with complaints where it is uncertain who, who made a mistake? Imagine me as a client, I come to your company and say, Leslie at Hello Customer, I'm not happy. Um, the results of your surveys are unclear and it's obvious that you've done something wrong. Which of course never happens. It never happens. We all know that. So you think this is strange, this feedback, huh? maybe. Let, let's try to see what really happened. How do you deal with a situation when there's a complaint and it's unclear what happens? Some organizations start an in-depth investigation trying to figure out who made the mistake and they spend a week to figure out who made the mistake. That's what they do first. Yeah, instead of fixing instead it. Instead of yeah. fixing it and getting the learnings afterwards. Of course, you can figure out what went wrong and have a conversation about it. But if you fix it first and then you do your investigation, then you're more customer-centric than the yep. other way around. That's number two. Number three is the amount of empowerment that the frontline staff gets from the management is number three. If a complaint comes in, if something goes wrong that isn't written down in some process, how far can those individual employees go to help a customer? One of my favorite examples is from the Ritz Carlton. All employees that work in a hotel have the freedom to compensate customers when something goes wrong up to $2,000. Wow. 
Wow. And the good thing is there's a line in the sand. If it's more, it's more complex, they cannot go beyond that. So they cannot do anything. Uh, there's a limit to $2,000, but it's quite a range that you have. Yeah. But it's important to have a limit because if you tell your employees it's unlimited, then they won't believe you and they will be scared to do anything. So at Ritz Carlton is very clear. $2,000 is your range that you can work with, which means that if you have a, uh, if you come into a room and you see that your bed hasn't been made up properly and you go outside and you talk to someone from the housekeeping uh, team and you tell them that, they will fix that. But they have the authority, the freedom, maybe to give you a bottle of champagne to compensate or to put some a box with chocolates uh, in the room to compensate for that. They have that freedom. And in many organizations, if you have a complaint and you ask someone, is this uh, something that we could do or this is something that didn't make me happy? Usually the answer is, let me call my manager. Yep. I hate that when that happens. Just help me. I don't want to talk to a manager. I want to be helped. And if you give your your team the freedom to do that, wow, customers just love that. So that's my checklist, opposing interests, fixing or investigating, and the empowerment, the level of empowerment of your frontline team. Okay, that's nice. And I think also when you talk about empowerment, we talked about it in our very first webinar we did uh, in, in September, you know, the whole empathy. Yeah. Um, how can empathy... And we talked about it in, in frontline um, interactions, but how can empathy also help product departments or service design departments? Empathy is probably the biggest asset you need to boost in your organization. Empathy is also the, the, the one domain where computers are not good at. Computers are good in being creative, huh? that, that ship has sailed, but empathy is something typically human. But it's not because you are human that you're good in being empathic. Yeah. Uh, th those are two different things. But it's our domain. So I think we need to boost that quality among our organization. And this is about understanding the human behind the customer. Yeah. This is about understanding the life of that human. Here it's not about optimizing the customer journey. Here it's about figuring out how to have a positive impact on the life of your customers. Here it's about figuring out how you can positively change the life of your customers. And then you're managing the life journey. And the life journey is not being around all the time and, and just being intrusive. No, the life journey is understanding customers, how you can bring value yeah. to their life. It's not about selling your products, it's about bringing value to their life. That's what empathy is about. Yeah. And there's a human component to that. As humans, we can connect. We, we instantly adapt our behavior if we feel that something happened with a certain individual. We can do that. That's part of our intellect. So working with humans will help you to be more customer-centric and to be more empathic. But you can also use digital to become more empathic. Um, proactive digital empathy is something to, to think about. Proactive digital empathy is using the deep learnings that you have based on your data about your customers to proactively bring certain services in the market. If you know, for instance, that based on data, that customers are uncertain about using a certain new service, or if for now, if they're uncertain to go on holiday, for instance, you know that and you can communicate proactively about that to make sure that they that they feel more secure, that it's more trusted. You be, can become crystal clear about certain doubts that your customers have in your online communication. So using the data can help you to become empath empathic proactively, where you don't have to wait until the customer tells you yeah, that, that they're unhappy, yeah. but you anticipate to it. That's also part of modern empathy, in my opinion. Yeah, and it's actually also how probably Central Beheer came to the little dense days because they were empathic with all those car drivers like yourself that occasionally dense the car. Yeah, and, and maybe to link it back to our previous webinar, maybe in the contact center they had so many people who called and said i have a little dent and then they figured out it wasn't worth it to fix it and then they said oh it's really sad because i had a new car i'm not going to fix it i wish there was a solution for that and if you Probably, link that back yeah. and say hey we had this this reaction 100 times why don't we solve it let's create yeah. the little dance days yeah so uh, translating the feedback to a service is, uh, is fantastic and that's indeed proactive Empathy yeah, at that moment. Yeah, absolutely. And also when we talk about service and, and creating new services, there was one question I thought it was was very interesting because it it's about you know service within the context. And this here is the context of retail, uh, which for many brands and sectors is not owned or exclusive, and you compete against 
others through the same retailer or dealer or products, how can how can you design it in such a way that you do st stand out? Yeah, if if you look at consumer brands, uh, the the Nestle's, PNGs, Danone's, yeah. those kind of brands, that's what we're talking about here. Right? They sell through the supermarket. Yeah. Let's be honest. In the past, it was really easy for them to be successful. There were two things that were important: penetration in the supermarket and awareness in the in the, in the, in the audience yeah. for yeah. your audience. So they talked with supermarkets to make sure that they had a great shelf space, and they bombed the entire planet with their advertisement. Today, we see changes in the market. The power of retailers has increased, uh, and as a consequence, they have their own brands that they push, and, and of course, then the big brands are, are losing market share. In term, that's suffering, uh, that, that's making them suffer on the, on the penetration side. On the other side, the impact of mass media is decreasing. Yep. So I think that they have to face reality that the old model is at its end of its lifetime and that you fundamentally have to rethink the way that you go to market. And it begins with innovation. Uh, I think in, in the world of, of packaged consumer goods that the innovation was way too incremental. It was about a new packaging, about a new label, about the yeah. strawberry taste instead of banana taste. That's what they've been doing in the last 20 years. Today, you really need to look to what brings value to the market. And, and, and create that deep understanding of the market and then come with innovation that really brings value. I think that's, that's the first thing you need to do. The second thing is when we look about digital, I think they need to figure out some new skills and create new skills. The first one is a direct to consumer skill. Yeah. Where you figure out a way how to get your products directly to the end user. Uh, and you feel how certain brands, big consumer brands, are experimenting, experimenting with that. Like Unilever had their Magnum ice cream, their flagship brand. In, in big cities last year, you could directly order that through Uber Eats. So they had these central locations and then you can get your Magnum ice cream when you were sitting in the park. You said, I crave for an ice cream. That's so that, that's an, yeah, that's that's an nice. experiment <clears throat> that they've done. But I think we need to go further in this and really develop a direct-to-consumer mindset. That's, that's a first digital skill that you need to train. A second one is change the way that you communicate. They grew up with mass advertisement for everyone. Now in the digital world, they're basically copy-pasting their experience from TV to Facebook. Yeah. It's not always a good idea because in the digital world, it's more about personalization. So maybe instead of creating this hugely expensive 30 second or one minute video that they then push through Facebook, I would recommend them to see if they, for instance, could make 100 types of advertisement really targeted to specific audiences to make sure that the message becomes more relevant. That's the strength of digital communication. You don't go out to the mass, you find something for a small, very targeted audience. And because of that relevance, they will order that product and more. And if you have a direct-to-consumer relationship, you can order it directly. Otherwise, hopefully, they will go to the retail uh, world. So that's the digital part. Then it's worthwhile to think beyond products. Okay. Uh, in, in my model of my latest book, The Offer You Can't Refuse, I have four layers. Huh? I have a product service um, as a minimum requirement, digital as a minimum requirement. I just talked about the impact of digital. But then you have partner in life. How can we add value in the, in the life of customers? And I think fast moving consumer good companies need to think in that direction as well. How can they use their strength to go beyond selling just a new product and a new taste to yeah. me? A great example, in my opinion, is Procter & Gamble with their Pampers division. They created a spin-off where they go directly to the customer. And the customer of Pampers are young parents. And young parents have worries, are concerned. Uh, they're concerned about the fact if their child is eating enough, if it's sleeping enough, if it's still breathing while it's sleeping, um, and they need to get new diapers all the time. So what they've done at, at Pampers, at P&G, is they created a whole package that you can buy from them with a smart mattress, smart camera, smart diapers, and you can monitor every statistic of wow. your child to know if it's sleeping well, if it's eating enough. And of course, it's automatically reordering diapers over and over again. You don't have to worry about that. And they grow together with the child because they can even see how big the child is, thanks to the camera. Yeah. And there you have the direct-to-consumer model. You have the technology aspect. 
but it's also going beyond selling diapers. You're helping me with all my concerns when I have a little baby in my house. And they created a new business model around that, a subscription model, direct to consumer, going beyond the product. That's, that's another aspect. And then the top of my model, uh, we have good product service price, we have digital convenience, we have partner in life. The top of the model is changing your world. How can you use your strengths to have an impact on society? Here, I would advise consumer brands to think beyond sustainability. Because if they hear changing your world, they all think, oh, we're reducing plastic in our packaging. And it's great, they need to do that. But I think that the whole aspect of sustainability in consumer goods will become a minimum demand quite mm -hmm. rapidly. The challenge is, can you create more value for society in a different way than just sustainability? Can you add social value? Can you, you know, help people with a healthy lifestyle? Yeah. Um, think about those things. And, and, and for me, this comes to fundamentally rethinking the way that you go to market, fundamentally rethinking your relationship, and really acknowledging the fact that the old model of penetration to retail, mass communication through traditional TV channels, is at the end of the life cycle. And today, most of those organizations know that, but they don't act upon it. And they just are stretching the life cycle of the existing model. And I think that is a dangerous strategy if you look at the evolution of retail and other aspects in the market. Yeah, it really reminds me, I don't know if you know that example of the, the razors, Gillette. Yeah, I do. I sometimes listen to these podcasts, Business Wars it is. And then um, they, they, you know, they, they started to lose market share at Gillette and they were innovating constantly. And then it could like take three hairs and not only yeah. two. And then, <laughs> you, then you think, okay, if, if that makes a difference. Um, but then there was this $1 shave, uh, club. shave club and then they came up. And I started reading about it. Like, why are they so popular? Because it's $1, they're not even that qualitative. But what they figured out in young men, gen the, the new generations, is that they don't have a lot of money to spend. And mm -hmm. if they want to spend it, they want to go to Starbucks to buy a $7 coffee. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so they came up with these razors that are have less quality, but men can afford them better. And it's an, a subscription model, so they, they don't have to think about buying new razors. They, they're just being sent. And I thought it was such a nice way of Gillette in their in their innovation departments, their product, their R&D, always, like you said, incrementally making the razors better, but also more expensive, yep. because that's also what the advertising says, and this patented this and patented that. True. But these young guys don't care. They just want to be shaved in a cheap way because they really don't have that much money to spend. Right. And then, boom, they started to win the market, also because they went direct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then they were sold to Unilever for a billion. Yeah, but then Unilever can do that as well. They can uh, they can just uh, buy these, co but it also yeah, shows but, uh, for a billion how much value it's a billion it has. plus. I think it's a smart move by Unilever to learn from those kind of organizations. Probably it's no surprise that Unilever is experimenting with direct to consumer now in other markets. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know when you're Gillette or One Dollar Shave Club, how can design or product departments know that they are doing? the right thing for customers. Are there KPIs in every department has their KPIs? Are there certain things that they can measure to understand is this product or this service successful for our customers? Yeah, the level of excitement. You, you can look at sales results and those are good measures, of course. But if you really want to understand if, it's, if something is a big hit or a success, then it's the level of excitement. Okay. Word of mouth, people that share the fact that they are buying the product and that they're excited about it. Uh, th th then you know that something big is going on. And if you take that into account and if you understand that excitement is really a driver for big success, then you can reverse engineer it. And you can start to think, okay, how can we build something that will create excitement? And, and we recently had an interesting case study in Belgium. It, it was organized by the biggest media app that we have in Belgium, HLN, yep. uh, linked to a newspaper here in Belgium. A couple of weeks ago, they had a 24-hour event in the largest um, concert hall in Belgium, in its Sport Palace. And they wanted to do something for their audience to, to share positivism in, this, in these difficult times. And they said, okay, we can do a concert. We could do a concert and invite five or six cool artists and we give we, we stream that and everyone has free access to it. We could do that. But will that create excitement? 
maybe. But they thought, how can we go beyond this? And they said, okay, what if we do it 24 hours? What if we make it a concert of 24 hours without even a minute of silence? We're gonna have 24 yeah, hours marathon. of music, the same band, and they're not gonna take a pause in those 24 hours. What if we do that? And we invite all artists that we have in Belgium there that wanna join. All right, let's do that. They checked with the band, they were excited. They checked with the artists, more than 100 Belgian artists were really excited to join. Then they said, what if we do it in the largest concert hall? That's what they've done as well. And suddenly it's not just we're doing a concert, suddenly it's we're doing a 24 hour live show from the biggest concert hall with all artists that we can find and you can watch that on our platform completely for free. Versus, we're gonna have an event with six people <laughs> yes. and uh, it's between nine and 10 in the evening on a Friday. Yeah. Uh, you, you can manage for excitement. And if you manage for excitement, you're actually managing your own success. So if you just take sales as a KPI, imagine what kind of decisions you make versus if you take level of excitement as KPI, you're gonna take completely different um, decisions yeah. and they will of course result in better sales. Yeah. So the starting point is different and you will decide differently. And because of that, you will become more successful. Yeah. Sales is the result from great exactly. products that yeah. foster excitement. Yeah. But if you take sales as KPI or financial results, you're going to think short term and you're going to take less risks. If you take excitement as KPI, you're going to build something that people never forget. All right. Excitement is the KPI, Stephen. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And we really hope to see you in the third and last webinar of this series. Bye. Bye. Bye.